Hello, my name is Gail Carr. I'm here today with Perry Downs. And Perry, thank you very much for coming in. It's a, a little bit of a humid day, so it's nice to well, be Well, it's able nice to in here. It's nice in here. So we want to have you take us down a tour of memory lane through your days at Plymouth State because you come from Plymouth Teachers College to Plymouth State College to Plymouth State University, I think. No, I... It was still Plymouth State College when I got here. Oh, and it yeah. wasn't Teachers College? No, when, when was that, 67, 68, something like that? Back in the good old days. Yeah, okay. So. so. Okay, so we'll say, when did you come to Plymouth, and what was it? Was it Teachers College, State yeah. College? And what about your, your first year of being here, as far as your salary, <laughs> students, employees, anything like that that you want to tell about? Well, there's so much to say about that first year. I was very excited to be here. It was my first job, first full-time job. Turns out my only full-time job, which was a, a, a choice on my part. I did Once I got here, I didn't want to go anywhere else. I mean, that's crazy. And uh, there's, there's a long story about a kind of faded uh, path that, that led me to this place. We can get into it at some point, but it was, uh, it was an exciting thing, and I was all eager to go, and I was chomping at the bit to teach. And uh, we were in the basement of Rounds Hall at the time, which is now the education department. Mm -hmm. And uh, those were really exciting days because the students then were uh, children of the 60s, mm -hmm. and they were all very, very ambitious personally, and they, they were ready to go, and they were responsive to uh, teachers, especially teachers like myself who didn't uh, try to make them do what I do, but, but to help them find their own path. So finding your path was something that I tried to do a lot, and students were very receptive to that. And the department was very small at the time. I think we must have had maybe 60 majors or something like this. This was art department. Art department, yeah. And, and maybe five or six faculty members, I don't know. There was Mary Taylor, Jim Fortune, Bob Morton, Chris Cressy, Don Glanz, and myself. Ellie Hayslip came. Oh, Ellie Hayslip. I'm sorry. I forgot about that. Yeah. And then after me came uh, a couple of a ceramist, and Don moved on. Mary Taylor st stayed as, as department chair, but you know, there was art history was a thing that, that they added on to and one studio. And then later, uh, in the 70s, 80s, we added graphic design mm -hmm. due to increased demand by students for something that's in the commercial realm, because we were a fine art department, as well as uh, art education. Mm -hmm. And I always felt closely allied with art education as a, as a teacher myself, and felt a responsibility to train other teachers to help other young people find their own path. So that was a great time. My salary was a whopping $8,500. Oh, wow. <laughs> and the first year we stayed here, we, we asked if they could find, if Mary could find us a place to rent. And, and I'm very naive, I would never ask anybody to do that now. But uh, we stayed in a, in a motel the Red Sleigh on Route 3 mm -hmm. in a little cabin for about two months till a, 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 a house opened up in Rumden. And uh, we were over there. And your father <laughs> was the first person to come visit us. I think he was curious and probably was assigned, go check these people out. And because uh, when we moved to town, the post office said, oh, you must be the Downses. Because we came to open up a post office box. And so everybody knew who we were already, and to a certain extent. But your father came out to where we were staying. It was up past the uh, past Jigs auction at the end of the road. And uh, that was a, a nice change for me because I got out every day. Poor, my poor wife, Miriam, she was sort of marooned at home. Mm -hmm. And uh, at least we had a dog that she could commune with. And uh, I had the only car as well. So that was part of the first year. Uh, how many years were you employed at Plymouth? Well, the 
we come up to last year, which I sort of, I think I had a course in the fall, one course, or what would that make it, 48, 47? 47 years, maybe. And what responsibilities came along with your position uh, of being faculty members and other Well, it, it was interesting, and, and towards the end, it changed a little bit because I became the gallery director. Mm -hmm. And uh, then I went to halftime, and that was a different situation. But I, I was a jack of all trades in the two-dimensional area. I taught uh, drawing and design, once in a while a painting class, uh, figure drawing, uh, and all kinds of printmaking from block prints, relief prints, to uh, silk screen, serographs, and etching or intaglio, and seminars and the BFA thesis program. So, and I designed a couple of new courses, courses for how to present your work and, and how to document it and Ironically, how to, how to put together websites to show your work off. I had the team teach to have someone else do that portion of it, but I knew it had to be done. And uh, now, of course, uh, I think they can do this in elementary school, <laughs> these kids. In any event, it, it was quite a variety of things. The, the biggest job that I had was managing the studio. And it's, uh, it was it's what finally caused me to to get tired, run out of energy, because it's such an enormous job. It's like having two jobs. Mm -hmm. In most universities, the, uh, there's a technician that manages the studio, the equipment, the supplies, and prepares the room and get, has everything ready. And the teacher just comes in and mm -hmm. lords over it all, mm -hmm. pontificates. Oh, do more of this, and do less of that. You know, kind of like that thing. Mm -hmm. So that, that was the hardest part of the job, was managing the studio. And uh, all of us in the art department, in, in painting and drawing and sculpture and ceramics, have the same issue. It's very, very tough. And it, I, I don't know if people realize what a studio is. It's like a shop. Mm -hmm. and, and managing that shop and keeping it operational is tough. Mm -hmm. When you got the offer to come to Plymouth State, what was it, what was it about the offer that made you accept it? Well, here's where the... The saga story, story comes yeah. in. I, I always think of this as, as being fated, and it had to do with having a goal. And I, I, I find, for the most part, the problem with, with young people today is they're goal-less. They, they drift. They don't really have a, a purpose, self-defined purpose. They, they don't have a path. They don't even cons consider that they should have one. They're just one day at a time kind of thing. So. I was not that way, and uh, it started when I was a little kid, like maybe 10 years old, and I grew up in Miami, so which is in Miami, Florida, entirely different universe than, than Plymouth and, and Romney. And uh, I was riding my bicycle down 17th Avenue, Northwest 17th Avenue. If you know Miami, it's just over the, the, uh, the bridge over the Miami River. I look up and there's a billboard on the side of the road. We have billboards in Florida, they don't have them up here. And there was a big picture of a country road. It was obviously New England and it was autumn. So it was all yellows and oranges and stuff I had never seen before in my life. And it was rural and bucolic and it was beautiful. And I'm saying, oh, that's, where I want to be, and uh, Miami was flat and a grid and hot, 365 days a year. You know, so the, I had never seen snow, and and still hadn't seen snow until I came to Plymouth. So, so anyway, I went to Miami Dade Junior College first after high school, and that was an enormous school. It's it's the biggest junior college in the country right now. I think there's something like 80,000 students over several campuses. Maybe it's bigger than that. And then I went to the University of Miami, which is about 20, 22,000 students. And then I went to Florida State University, which is about the same 20, 22,000 students. So I've always been in a big city, in a 
flat environment, hot, no change of seasons, in a big university or academic setting. Nothing was ever, ever intimate in that sense. And I, so you have to make those things for your own self. So I, when I got to the junior college, I said, well, this is really fantastic because it, it inspired me, the quality of the instruction, the dialogue, and the conversations that took place and such a difference of high school. I said, this is like night and day. This is what I want to be. I want to be a college professor. It doesn't get any better than that. And they pay you to do it. So <laughs> that was my attitude. And uh, so, well, how do I get to do that? And I said, well, you have to, I said to myself, you have to have a terminal degree, which I went out and got two, a master's and a master of fine arts from Miami and Florida State. And I need to have an exhibition record. So I, I had group shows and one person shows while I was a student at the University of Miami. And I need to have uh, letters of recommendation from significant people. So I had professors, I had a gallery director, and then I had a dean of the School of Fine Arts at Syracuse University write me a letter. And I was able to do that because he had been the chair of the art department at the University of Miami before he left to go there. So I got it on his stationery and went, oh, this, this is impressive. And so, I had all those criteria. Then I won a big show called The Best of Florida. I won first prize. The best, I'm the best. And got a one person show out of that. And then uh, all this added up on my resume. Um, oh, and teaching experience. I, I taught in uh, a number of places, even when I was at the junior college and later at Miami. I taught as a graduate assistant at Florida State and was like the number two guy in printmaking after my professor, uh, who was a big name in printmaking, uh, Arthur Deshays, and uh, I used to have to cover for him a lot. <laughs> in any event, I didn't care. It was, it was great. Graduate school was great. So I had teaching experience there, but I also taught at a, a, a school for special needs kids in the summer, a, a camp. I was stunned after I'd been there for two months to come back to the city and realize you know, what a change everything is because I got so used to them. And so <laughs> that, that, was, uh, that was quite an experience. And I taught at a retirement home. And uh, we'd go there and I'd bring the supplies and people would paint and everything. And I taught at a nursing home. And I discovered there when you called the roll, if someone was absent, they had an excuse. So where's uh, where's Martha? And uh, oh, she died. Uh, oh, okay. We had to scratch her off. So, so when students would come to me, I couldn't come to class, Mr. Dale, because I was skateboarding or something like that. I had, I had no sympathy for absenteeism ever, and I, I don't think I was ever absent ever in the 47 years. I might have been. Maybe I was sick, but I would come sick too. They would have to send me home because I would be too bad if, if it was that bad. But I just don't remember ever being absent. Why would I not want to go in? You know, it was crazy. Anyway, I, my wife and I wrote about 250 letters and sent them out all over the place, mostly New England, but also Colorado and Montana, you know, places like that, and a couple of big name places in between. The only, oh, and the criteria I wanted for a place to be was a small college with a small department uh, and live in a small town next to it and ride to work on that road that I saw on the billboard and be equidistant from, in a day's drive from, say, the big art centers of the Northeast, like Boston, New York, and Montreal, mm -hmm. and like Domino's. <sighs> Every single point, every single point happened. Now, I attribute that to the fact that I had a goal that I set back when I was 10 years old. And you just keep doing things that cause you to, to aim, go in that direction. And it happens. It eventually takes place. And that's all, at least in my experience, you have to do to get what you need in life. And, and uh, so that's how I came here. And obviously, you were very pleased that everything fell into place. Oh, yeah, you big time. You were able to do that. 
was there someone at Plymouth that had an influence on you when you first arrived and were busy in the art world? Oh. Well, everybody in the, in the art department. Bob Morton was a good friend. Uh, Jim Fortune was another one. Mary Taylor, Chris Cressy. Those, those are the big ones. Yeah. And what influence do you feel you had on the institution, on the students, uh, even on the area during your time here? Well, I don't know. I think I, I made a lot of friends here, and I think I helped with um, morale because mm -hmm. I'm very cheerful, mm -hmm. and I enjoy knowing everybody from administration to faculty to operating staff to PATs and and I made friends and I was on a first name basis with practically everybody mm -hmm. so I was uh, I kind of cheered people up because it was my natural nature I think I, I'm, I'm, I'm I'm a cheerful person what changes uh, did you see in the institution when, oh. you, when you first started uh, well it, it was <laughs> it was like a rat hole at first the, the, the campus was not very man, well managed physically, you know, it, it, the, the things operated well, but it didn't look nice. It wasn't beautified. Mm -hmm. And uh, Steve Swiegler, mm -hmm. who a good friend of mine still, um, came on to maintenance and was like the bottom rung. He might have even been the, the feet of the ladder, you know, he was that low down. And, uh, they, they put him in charge of landscaping because he had a degree in horticulture. You know, he, he was a serious person. And he started changing the, the look of the place. Mm -hmm. And in keeping with that look, they were, they were going to put in walkways all over campus mm -hmm. and pave them with tar. <laughs> and I remember Dick Honeywell, who was a young art historian at the time, got on the committee about this and said, no, 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 we're not going to do that. And uh, it ended up being brick walkways in keeping with the majority of the buildings that were in existence. Yeah. And uh, one thing led to another, and, it, and Steve created a standard of aesthetic understanding and, and purpose that raised a, a concern for quality across the board with everybody. So if anybody had a significant impact on the place, it was Steve. In, in that sense, and, and you probably won't hear that from anybody else because it was just the look, but the look came first and then everybody tried to keep up with it, is the way I view it, not the other way around. Well, and there were a lot of moves, uh, you know, you moved from the basement of, you yeah, came I mean, out from under the, yeah. the basement around. Which I didn't mind at all, you know, if you're an artist, you make art everywhere. Right. And we moved into the brand new Hyde Hall, yeah. and we were in there for... It must have been 15 years or so. And then we moved into the D&M building. And that, what, that was another treat. Was a, and that's where we are today in the art department. Now, Mary Taylor House had... Oh, yes, we had the Mary Taylor House. That was, I forget what it was before we got hold of it, but we used it for seminars and offices because the office situation on campus was... Like, nobody ever plans for storage in offices. It's just classrooms and, and major uh, functions, but individual offices, no. You can sit in your car and you can, that can be your office. <laughs> you can't find a copy. <laughs> yeah, you can't. <laughs> uh, how has the Plymouth area changed over the time that you've been here? Well, it, crept closer to Romney. <laughs> it's starting to creep. There, there's another big box store going in over there. And so the, it's just been slow, gradual growth. And uh, it, it's, it's different. Romney has pretty much stayed the same, mm -hmm. which is, it's eight miles away and it's up a narrow river valley. And, and so it's not gonna get impeded upon too much, at least not in our lifetime. What changes, if any, have we learned from our past that might support those working at Plymouth today? But who's learned from their past? Individually, in my own past? You can answer it however you would oh, like to. I don't to. know. Do you think uh, we've learned something? No, from? no. I think faculty have uh, started to drop the ball. When, when I came here, 
faculty were very independent-minded and interconnected. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that happened was we all got separated mm -hmm. and put into silos, mm -hmm. physical silos. And much of what's discussed on campus amongst faculty is how programs are siloed. Well, that, they were always siloed. But what actually took place, we were physically siloed. So you, at, when we, we stopped having large group uh, faculty meetings where everything was decided right then and there, and, and we debated and discussed and, and nominated people for things, that was on the spot, and it kept us together. And the, the physical separation, like in, in uh, the DNM building, you could be in there for years and never see anybody from another department. And that, that's, that was a significant thing. And so faculty let that kind of thing happen. And it, there was a kind of a us versus them uh, approach that began with another department that became very populated and numerous with, with students that sort of changed the character of the programmatic uh, thrust of the college from a liberal arts college into a more of a professional school. And, you know, I can understand the, the fear that parents have about their kids making a living. And that's, that's sort of what drove that kind of experience. But it caused the institution to change from a liberal arts college into something else. The, uh, the program act that we're going under now with this cluster thing has the potential for overcoming that. But I don't know if it's being done the right way. And it, a, a cluster is not a new idea, especially in the arts. Uh, the great influential art school in, that was in Germany in the 20s, the Bauhaus, was a perfect example of this kind of cluster thing. It had painting, it had design, it had stagecraft, it had architecture, it had all, all these disciplines housed together and interdependent. And uh, so sometimes things get arbitrary and don't have a kind of programmatic coherence to it. And it's just top-down kind of thinking, which I don't really enjoy at all. I'm a bottom-up guy. I'm a grassroots person all the way. Yeah. Is there anything we haven't covered that you'd like to share with our audience today? Hmm. Any stories? prompted a little bit better. I have, I have multiple stories. But something with a student, something with a department, something with a colleague, something uh, that really touched your heart. Well, there's, there's so many great students that I had, not just in printmaking, but in other areas, sure. because we did overlap within the art department. And it, it was so encouraging to see them develop and go on and be themselves you know there's a lot of times in in art faculty uh, people want to have disciples mm -hmm. and their work has to resemble theirs and I was never like that and, and uh, I'm glad that, that that didn't happen with me and my students and the people that I came in contact with you just encouraged them and you were a role model well, yeah, all them, of that, you know. And they could make their own decision yeah. and then fly. Right. Well, one of the things that I always thought of myself that here was like Bach in, in, uh, in his day. I was like an artist in residence. Mm -hmm. And so the teaching was just, you know, what do I do this next hour? Okay, teach this, I'm sure. But I was an artist first and a teacher second. And the students knew that. And they responded to me. I didn't come across to them as an authority, saying, you do what I tell you to do because I'm the authority and I say so. It was like, well, you could do it this way. And you know, I, I, I work for me, and I can show you examples, but it's up to you. You can decide. And they eventually would stumble and make a few mistakes, and, and then they'd come around in some new way. And mm -hmm. the, one of the challenges I used to give them was, to, well, you come up with a better idea than mine, and I'll be happy. So they, they would push themselves to do that. And artists are notorious night owls, and so the, the lights would be on in whatever building I was teaching in for the longest time. Oh, we had one class that was special. I remember this one. 
we were in memoriam and it was being vacated for whatever they were going to do with it at the time and they had torn down the, the old high school and I was once again marooned there they, they, they gave me a huge classroom I, I have to kick myself about this one because I did not take advantage of it as much as I could have I, I could have had the whole building as a studio and moved in and just gone to town and I felt guilty about that it was like serve all this, this is too much. And so I didn't really exploit it, which I could have, but I, so I was stupid. But I did do quite a bit of work up there. I had a lot of floor space, which I don't have at home. I have a very small house and small studio and all that. But one of the things that I had done in a, one of the class was to do a construction and assemblage course that I took at Bennington College one summer. And I came back with these ideas and I had made a few of these pieces and it's like found sculpture. and <laughs> it's, it requires one to go to a dump and pick. <laughs> so we would go take field trips to the dump and, and people would come back with buckets of stuff, you know, and then we'll, let's put this together and make something out of it. And so they would assemble it and rearrange it and paint it and do all kinds of things. And it was, it was astonishing, the productivity that took place. Mm -hmm. And the students took over the whole building. It was like three floors, mm -hmm. or was it four, counting the basement? I think it was four. Yeah, every single space was filled by this class and all the students that were in it. And they almost all had their own room to work in. And this, the churning out of creative energy, I mean, that, that was the most important thing. I don't know if any of the work survived, but it didn't matter. You know, They just took stuff and assembled it in an aesthetic way and that you couldn't, you couldn't hold them back. You know, it was like a dog and jumped the leash, broken the leash, jumped the fence, and was running down the road, eyeballs on springs, mm -hmm. and tongues streaking out behind. <laughs> they were like that, mm -hmm. and so I just went, "Wow, this is great." Education and learning yeah. at its best. Do more of that. And do less of that. You know, that was all I had to do. Yeah. You know? So that that was a wonderful experience. Yeah. 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 I'm glad we were able to capture this. Yeah. Yeah. Very encouraging, enlightening, and, and great to have you share this.